write a business plan. But I've done my homework and I've basically taken that huge risk and actually quantified it so that now I have the guts to take it on. Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing? I hear it's minus 19 outside and we'll drop to minus 25. Oh my God. Um, anyway, trying not to think about that right now. Welcome back to Entrepreneurship 101 and or Meet the Entrepreneurs event. We have a great panel lined up and I'll introduce them. I'll welcome them up in a minute, but we do have some, a few announcements, including a couple of very exciting announcements. Firstly, as usual, if you have not had your stamp card stamped, please do so before 6.15 because we close the registration desk. Shout out to our webcast participants from NORCAT in Sudbury, Innovation Factory in Hamilton, and Haltech in Halton. Always good to have you joining us. Um, our networking categories for this evening are biotechnology and pharmaceuticals, medical devices and diagnostics, healthcare IT, and if you don't fit into any of these categories, you're still very much welcome here, it's just other. Um, so if you have a name tag, you will have, a, your name tag will have a dot that's um, associated with any of these categories. We do encourage everyone to network. We do have cash bar and food outside at the end of the event after the panel is over. So it's a good time to mingle um, and to just to meet lots of people and have great conversation or carry on great conversation rather. So a very exciting announcement for us this evening. We are thrilled to announce that KPMG will be sponsoring the 2014 Upstart Competition Prize of $15,000. KPMG has been a strategic partner of Mars for many years, supporting our critical work in systems change, and will now be working directly with startups as well as supporting entrepreneurship programs by their sponsorship of Upstart. The Mars team is really looking forward to broadening our relationship with KPMG over the coming year. And in the audience tonight, we have Addy and Linda from the KPMG team. So let's give a big round of applause to them and the overall support that their team has shown for Mars. One last announcement before I bring John Rogers up, who is our moderator for this evening. Our, upstart, um, our Entrepreneurship 101 goes on a mini hiatus the week of March 10 to 14. That is March break for a lot of students, and we do have a lot of students participating. Um, so we take um, a little break, and then we come back the following week um, and resume our lectures. So if you come here um, the March 12th, there won't be anybody here. It's, it's a good time to catch up on lectures that you've, you've missed. We do record all our lectures. So it's a, it's a great way to, to get caught up. So on to the more exciting aspect of the evening. Our moderator, John Rogers, is a Mars advisor with our life sciences and healthcare practice. And he's also a partner and life science practice leader at SPG Management Consulting. He's done a lot of work with startups in the past, and he's done quite a bit of work with large companies as well. But I'll let him do his own introduction. Please join me in welcoming John to the stage. Thank you so much. A pleasure to meet all of you, and I look forward to shaking each of your hands after. Uh, first, I want to apologize. I'm a little bit sick this evening, so you'll hear that. The good news is, that's right, that's why I'm going to shake your hands, that's right. Uh, the good news is that my voice gets two to three octaves lower, so I, this is the week I re-record all my voicemails. Uh, so just a little bit of background on myself. Again, my name's John Rogers. Uh, I am an advisor here at Mars Discovery District. My full-time job is I run my own consulting practice focused on life sciences, which has been tremendous. Uh, I've been doing this for about four years now. Uh, very much focused on entrepreneurial startup companies, work with some good mid-sized companies, as well as some extremely large uh, multinationals, both here in Canada as well as globally. Prior to that, I used to work for Procter & Gamble early on in my career, Bausch & Lomb, the eye care company, as well as Medtronic leading businesses both in Canada, US, as well as globally. So I feel like I have some good discussion. I've actually had a chance to work in all three of the dots, uh, pharmaceutical, medical devices, over the counter, and also a new classification we have in Canada called natural health products. So it's great. That's a little bit about me. I first now would like to introduce some of our uh, panelists. Actually, I'll let them introduce themselves. Hello, can you hear me? Perfect. Hi everyone, my name is Chacha Sun and I'm the CEO of Demiva and uh, we are a women's health company 
developing all natural products. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you tonight the roller coaster that I've been on uh, since we launched our product uh, last year. Our first product from this company, it's an all natural vaginal lubricant targeting menopausal women, and it's the first one in the global marketplace. It was launched with a huge bang because I got to say the V word on national TV with the Dragon's Den. And uh, since then, we have uh, been uh, lining up the retail chains and pharmacies in Canada, and we're uh, planning our U.S. launch for later this year. So I um, look forward to talking to you all afterwards and sharing some of the story. Hi, everyone. My name is Joanna Griffiths, and I am the chief Nixpert, or founder and CEO at Nixwear. And what we are is we're a high-tech women's underwear company. So we take great designs, beautiful fabrics, and in every pair we insert our patented technology that's moisture-wicking, leak-resistant, anti-odor, and absorbent. Um, so we're a Canadian-based company here in Toronto. Uh, we launched with a crowdfunding campaign in May of last year and made crowdfunding history when Hudson's Bay placed an 18-store pre-order online through our, through our crowdfunding campaign. So we actually set up a PayPal account and went through all these jumps to become our first retail partner, which is very exciting. And um, we recently launched a new athletic line that I will tell you more about later. But um, that's it for me. I'm Don Waugh. I'm co-CEO of Applied Recognition. Applied Recognition uh, specializes in the application of face recognition technology for consumer applications. We're not spies. Um, and so we have desktop products, uh, but uh, five, give me five weeks and we'll have face recognition on your cell phone. So when you take a, a picture, tag, and it goes up to Facebook, it goes to your own personal album. All of that tagging is done. Now it's organized. So imagine what you can do for a wedding where everyone's standing taking pictures and tagging it for the bride and groom. All those candidates are all organized for them. You can do it for soccer teams, you can do it for baseball teams, you name it. I um, have started a couple of companies. My first one was, I used to be actually the CFO for one of the centers of excellence and uh, really believe in the R&D investment to create new products and services and uh, actually ended up licensing one uh, from one of the centers in the data storage area. Uh, from there, I started an internet company. It's now known as EchoWorks PKI, encryption of mail and statements and files. And um, I was also the inventor and founder of PharmaTrust, uh, which is, I don't know if you heard about it, it was an ATM for dispensing medicine. It's now owned by Walgreens and uh, Alliance Boots. Well, th thank you to all. Um, as I got to know each of the entrepreneurs, I was really very, very much impressed with how they were able to articulate the value proposition of their company. Many times when I meet entrepreneurs, they can speak about the technology, but they can't really in a holistic way speak about the value proposition. So just as a learning opportunity here, I wanted to ask each person, starting with Don, just to go through and share with the audience the value proposition of your, of your company. You know, when I start a company, I have five questions I have to ask myself, answer. Who's my customer? What's the value proposition to the customer? What is it worth to the customer? How many customers are there? And what's the channel to the customer? And so the value proposition tends to be the hard one to articulate, or actually the hard one is price it, especially when it's a new product in a totally new area. But this is something that uh, I read. It was a two-page uh, paper from Gardner. And, um, and it, it's how you measure your pro value proposition. So if I'm talking to a customer, this is in sort of the um, any business customer. And so if you're talking to Walmart, you're going to say, well, this is how much you're going to be able to make if you sell this product. Or if you adopt this technology, you'll reduce your costs. So when I have a new technology, I try to measure it. And if I can get three of those, boy, I have a really strong value proposition. And so if you actually, it's funny when you take a product and you're talking to Rogers TV or you know, Rogers Communications or ZTE or, you know, the, the list goes on and on. Uh, but you can take it and you can apply it. And so the number one reason that you would actually, the customer will buy, and you can see on the, on the, uh, the left-hand side, you know, the high, low is the probability of making the purchase. The other part is your sales cycle, um, the speed of making that purchase. And so if the law has changed, 
Now you have to buy it. You don't have a choice. And so being able to sell it is really easy. Um, but the one that really turns everyone on is that if you buy this, you will make money. And everyone wants to do that, especially your customer. Um, and of course, that's going to add, you know, go to the bottom line. Uh, if you buy it, it'll reduce your cost. Once again, it goes to the bottom line. So, um, and then finally, you know, safer. It's more secure. It's everything from data storage to insurance. Um, and first to market, if you can offer a customer or a channel partner the first to market that gives them a lead in the competition and differentiates themselves in the market, that has a lot of value. So if you can get three of those together, you have a very strong value proposition. So could you just make this real for us and maybe speak about Pharma Trust or your current organization? Just how did you present when you were speaking with potential investors, pitching your company to uh, customers? How did you articulate that, this graph, in a very concrete way? Well, you know, in the case of Pharma Trust, um, it, um, the one thing I learned, you know, because there's four companies, um, at the beginning I was pushing technology. And when you're in love with your technology, that's what you want to talk about. But who cares? It's actually, what does the customer need from you? What are you going to fulfill? And so, um, you know, ATM for pharma, you could put this into a doctor's office, you can put it into an emergency department of a hospital, you could put it into a remote community, one of the aboriginal communities. Um, you can put it in a pharmacy and allow it to stay open for 24 hours a day. I wasn't selling technology, you know, the, um, the inspiration behind that was the business model. It was the ability to stay open 24 hours a day. It's the ability to actually deliver a product more securely at lower cost. And, um, and so that, you know, the value proposition was very, very strong. And it had nothing to do with the technology. It had to do with the business model. Um, in the case of applied recognition, it's now that's for the consumer. And uh, so I save them time but I also can do something that they've never been able to do, which is actually organize all their photos into a family tree or do that wedding app. So, you know, it's, it's a really do need to understand it, but if I'm gonna to sell to someone, what's my channel, I have to show them how they're gonna make money from it. And, and I guess in the case of Pharma Trust, looking at your graph, one of the first technologies to market, yeah. safe and secure, does reduce the cost of dispensing because you don't need a pharmacist, increases revenue because you can go in new areas uh, that traditionally pharmacists wouldn't make sense to open up a full pharmacy on, and probably does follow the legal requirements of being able to track medications, et cetera. You know, what was interesting is the value proposition was very strong, and you know, this is all about accessibility. And so the government, um, the Minister of Health, when he saw it, he goes, we have to change the law to allow this, and, um, and they did, which was great. Um, but it is in the hands of Walgreens and Boots, no longer Canadian, so what can I say? <laughs> Good, well, thank you, Don. Okay, Joy? Sure, so um, at the core of what we do at Nixware, we like to say that we make women's every day a little bit better. And that might sound ridiculous for an underwear company, but um, one in three women, when they start having kids, they leak a little when they laugh or they sneeze or they cough or they do a jumping jack. 60% of women experience leaks during that time of the month, even though they're wearing a tampon, let's say. And um, in the underwear market, best case, you know, it looks great. Um, but what we do is we provide women with something that looks great, that fits great, and that has our t patented technology built in so that their every day is that little bit easier. Um, so that's how I like to explain what we do. Good. And how have people been responding to the value product? Do they get it right away? Is it something that makes sense? Yeah, I think, you know, I interviewed hundreds of women in, in creating this product and really tried to understand what they were looking for in their underwear. Um, and so what we do is we do fashion, function, and fit. And that's really appealing for women. A lot of women are frustrated by their underwear. I know there's a lot of men in the room, and that might sound like a ridiculous thing to say, but it's the first thing that you put on, and it's the last thing that you take off. And if, if it's uncomfortable or if it doesn't fit properly or if it doesn't make you feel confident, then it can have a really big effect on your day. And so by not making women compromise on any one of those three elements, there's been an overwhelming response. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Cha-cha. I have a slide as well, okay. if uh, you could pull it up. Perfect. There you and, go. Um, I, just, um, I just wanted to show you all um, mm -hmm. I think what is, for me, inspirational in terms of uh, what happens 
when you're able to articulate your product value. And in the case of our product, in some ways it's very straightforward. Uh, many people compare it to Burt's Bees. Burt's Bees came on the scene when there was Carmex and Chapstick and there was no natural alternative for women looking for a lip balm. And so very similarly, we have the first all natural vaginal health alternative for women, and this really came out of uh, a lot of my cancer research. I, I'm a pharmaceutical executive uh, by training for 15 years, and uh, when, uh, when I discovered that 85% of women have vaginal dryness after menopause and 40% have pain with intercourse, these numbers were astounding, and I actually went to shelves and looked to see what is there on the shelf in the pharmacy for women. Uh, I knew what there was from a medical perspective, obviously systemic hormone replacement therapy and other hormone, uh, hormonal alternatives, but I wanted to know what can you buy on the shelf in a pharmacy. So I, I looked around, I didn't see anything that um, was uh, appealing. It all had uh, water, uh, glycol, glycerin, parabens, you name it. And I just thought, you know, is this possible that there is no natural alternative? So uh, I did my research. Uh, my uh, business partner, uh, who's here, uh, and personal partner, uh, uh, formulated the product with me. And, uh, and we um, featured it on the Dragon's Den. And then the business actually became real. <laughs> because that's when the pharmacies... We, were, we thought, oh, we'll just you know, do this on the side while we have our pharmaceutical careers. And uh, the pharmacies started asking us for the product, and, and I kept putting them off saying, oh, we're not really selling. You know, maybe down the road we'll get a distributor and we'll sell to pharmacies. But uh, then we realized there's a huge need out there. Women were calling me from all over Canada. And the pharmacies uh, recognized the product value very quickly. And I think speaking to Dawn's points, they are very important. They did see this as a revenue generator. Retail chains are being hit by very low margins these days on their generic drug prescriptions. And, uh, and they saw this as, uh, this is in the feminine hygiene category, they saw this and uh, see this as a rapidly increasing category, double digits every year. And so we went from uh, zero sales to national distribution in eight months. And what um, you see here when you see the new sign, that's our product, it's called May, M-A-E. And um, what's really interesting here is when drug trading, which has 2,500 stores across Canada, when they did a strategic uh, overview of their feminine hygiene planogram, they told me that all the products on, on the market uh, essentially are temporary solutions that over a long term make the uh, condition worse. And so um, I think it's, for me, very inspirational, you know, as a Canadian company with an, what we consider to be an international brand that um, Canadian retailers really came and supported uh, us you know, right away. They not only listed us, uh, they put us in both their two and four foot planograms. So that means essentially even their stores that have only two feet of shelf space uh, are required to list our product. Uh, and what they also did was they also put us above all our competitors. So you can see we're at uh, shelf um, height three, three feet, you know, four inches or something. And um, all our competitors are below us. And these are the Kimberly Clarks of the world and so forth. So um, I think, uh, you know, what I want to uh, communicate is that if you can communicate your product value, the buyers will understand and grasp that right away. And in here in Canada, we found them to be extremely supportive. And so it is, it's key to uh, a product success. And if you're a company like ours, which only has one product on the market, it's key to our company's success. Fantastic. Value proposition, the most important uh, element of the business case. Thank you. So I want to change to talk a little bit about commercialization. It's an area that I study a great deal. And as I got to know each of our entrepreneurs, I was really inspired about the different ways they 
looked at commercialization and the different things that they emphasize. First, Cha Cha, you spoke a little bit about building an international company right from time zero. And I just wanted to know if you could ex expand to the audience why that was such an important element of your business proposition, building an international company right from time zero. My uh, experience has really been international. So I've worked in uh, the US, Canada, as well as Europe, uh, Denmark, and the UK. And so uh, right from the first initial conceptualization, it was really, and knowing the Canadian market represents, in the scheme of things, a fairly small market, it was really uh, believing that um, we needed to build an international brand and company right from the get-go. So our branding is uh, really about developing uh, products that in a box you would consider socially taboo. Uh, first of all, vaginal dryness is our first taboo topic that uh, we're choosing to deal with. Uh, my teenagers might, you know, say those are all really awkward, mom, you know, but that was part of our goal is to uh, address very awkward issues uh, in women as we age. Uh, these include uh, growth of facial hair, hair loss, uh, halitosis, bad breath, you know, these are all uh, important health issues that women care about, you know, as we age. Uh, and so that was our, that's our brand. Our brand has a sort of quirky, edgy, socially, you know, taboo perspective. Um, the most challenging part about building the company for an international scale is, you know, what happens when you're out there shopping around a PowerPoint idea? I mean, really, at the beginning, I didn't have anything except a PowerPoint. And I was going to manufacturers, you know, saying, hey, I have this idea you know, for a product, I've done the research, I think this would really work. And, um, and then, you know, ha rather than having um, the doors closed on me, you know, how, how do you persuade those vendors, packagers, manufacturers, suppliers, marketing company, uh, you know, how do you uh, persuade them all uh, to be part of an international brand? And, not only that, but as we've seen as we scale up, so this is just, uh, you know, our box uh, that is essentially the box that we began with. Uh, when we first started, essentially we were looking at 100 boxes, right, right, as a prototype, you know, at $6 a box, which is just not commercially feasible. Mm -hmm. And how do you get a company to, uh, you know, that's saying, well, I'm going to charge you $6 a box, to then go down to $3 and then $1 and now down to eventually 30 cents, which is actually the point at which it becomes commercially feasible. And what I really found was um, amazing was that I was able to engage uh, Canadian-owned entrepreneurial companies as partners. So my manufacturers in Vaughan, they are Canadian-owned. And they are obviously were much bigger than me when we started and still are. Um, however, they believed in the product, the vision, and they invested. They put in um, about $150,000 worth into machinery as well as a dedicated GMP suite to manufacture our product. And uh, what they saw as the um, possibility was international expansion. You know, right from the get-go, we told them we will be building an international company. Uh, and they've been wonderful partners uh, for us, you know, right from the beginning. That's Dynamize Botanicals. And the packaging company was a little bit more difficult because uh, they were a Canadian company that was bought by a U.S. company. And so um, we found that working with them was entirely different. And we actually eventually switched uh, packaging companies once we scaled up. Because although they had created a small business unit, their main clients were Loblaws and Sobeys. And so they were able to scale to the 100,000 boxes a month that we need for US scale. However, um, they really didn't know how to work with smaller companies that are always strapped for cash flow, that are asking for changes last minute because we don't know what we're doing. 
et cetera, et cetera. And um, they didn't see our business as, uh, as important enough compared to the Loblaws and the Sobies of the world. So we ended up making a very time consuming uh, and costly packaging change. Um, and um, our marketing company, um, Open Creative, also invested in us right from the beginning. Um, they were just starting out as well. They had more staff and they've grown considerably. Uh, and, but they essentially, uh, they essentially believed that they could, for the first time in their careers, the two partners, be part of uh, design and brand development for an international brand. And uh, they've been um, wonderful partners too. And uh, you know, I, I just emailed them today because they're uh, their uh, packaging and design will be featured in a, in a fashion magazine for the first time this spring, and so uh, this will be the first time. And so the, the difficult part was right from the beginning, finding the right vendors who can grow from 100 boxes to 100,000 boxes a month. I mean, I think it's really important, especially having worked across all the different industries, medical devices, pharmaceuticals, etc. In the consumer packaged goods world, not only being able to clearly articulate your value proposition, but knowing that economies of scale are so important and to have an effective price and be able to compete with the other multinationals, you got to get that international scale. So that international business decision was critical, so I applaud you on, on that in that regard. Thank you, and I really believe that it, it's not a coincidence that right now my main partners that are helping uh, as scale up for uh, a U.S. launch and um, and international sales are uh, Canadian-owned uh, yes. private companies, entrepreneurial as well. More than anything, Canadians look outside to the rest of the world and right. many other markets. U.S. very insular. Right. Thank you, Joanna. When I, when we were speaking on the phone, you actually stressed a different part of your commercialization plan, which I thought was really neat. You talked about the value and the importance of a niche market. Most people kind of say, oh, I don't want a niche market. They look for big markets, and whatever market is the biggest, that's the one they are attracted to. You said, no, nope, I'm going to focus after a niche but potentially lucrative market. Could you tell us a little bit, a bit about that journey? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think marketing is always difficult, and it's, it's hard to get your, your message out there. And so if you're offering something really unique to a certain customer base, and you know, I, I agree with you on so many levels in terms of packaging and gambling to win big. I mean, our first production run, we did 25,000 units, which is a ton. Yeah. And um, That's a lot of underwear. That's a lot of underwear. <laughs> and I feel like every single decision that I've been making over the past you know, year and a half, it's always been, I'm going to gamble and I'm going to think big, and I hope that it just works. But, but um, you, have to be, you have to think big to be taken seriously. Right. And um, so, so the example that I was talking about with you, we have, like, we have mainstream success, and so we're in Hudson's Bay, and we're in Equinox gyms in the US. But um, a cool example of, of a way where we've gone really niche is that my colleague is an avid horseback rider. And so she loves to ride horses, and she started giving samples to some of her friends who ride horses. And all of a sudden, we were becoming kind of a hit in the equestrian world, which um, to me is hilarious because I don't really know very much about horses. But um, all of a sudden, we had these Olympic riders who were wearing our product and talking about it. And we were getting into some of the top sort of tack shops um, in Canada and in the, in the US. And so um, one of our retailers suggested that we should go to this trade show in King of Prussia, uh, <laughs> Pennsylvania. So we went at the end of January and did a three-day show there and it was a really great example of if you can find a small niche, it doesn't even have to be the entirety of your business, but we left that show and every single person at the show was talking about us. We were the knicker girls. We were, you know, the hit of the show because they hadn't had an underwear company be there ever. Actually, our product is a really great solution for riders because a lot of women, you know, it's hot up against the saddle and we have moisture wicking and sweat wicking and leak resistant and it helps protect the life of the saddle. Our underwear is probably, I will say this, the most seamless underwear on the planet and pants don't get any tighter than those white pants that the riders make. And so that's what we did. We wore this, this skin tight pants and as embarrassing as it is, I show, turned around a million times a day and showed everyone that I had no panty lines on my bum, which is uh, our, our go-to sales tactic. And we lined up um, 20 retailers over, 
in the course of three days. We made international contacts. We're going to go to a fair in Germany in September. All these retailers are talking to us about white labeling our product, because, which we can do because we set it up that way where our technology is actually actually separate from the brand that we're building. So if we have a big partner and they want to do that, we're prepared to do that. But um, it's, it, for us, it's just an example of take a market that's been overlooked, and if you go in there and you do it right and you give it the attention that it deserves, it could actually be a big part of your business. We might very well sell more underwear to equestrian riders this year than we do to the entire other market combined. Absolutely. And you know, your, this comment about focusing on niche markets very much ties to your initial comment about value proposition. Yes. It is so much easier to define a very tight, clear value proposition for a niche market versus you know, trying to be a big fish in a small pond as opposed to being a big, fi a big fish in right. a big pond. Yeah. Really, really challenging. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we learned that the hard way. I mean, I think yeah. we were talking on the phone. When we launched the business, I said, you know, this is a, a product that was inspired by new moms, and so we're going to go after the mommy blogger community. And I don't know if any of you were thinking about making products that um, are targeted towards that group. But I very quickly discovered that mommy bloggers want to be paid to write about products. And we didn't have any money because all of our money was in production. And that we were like trying to make, you know, we were one tree in a giant forest and right. trying to make some right. noise. And it was just, it ended up being a huge waste of time. And it's not to say that we won't get there. That's right. But, um, you know, you want to, if you want to grow quickly, I would suggest maybe considering some niche markets to start. Good. And we're going to come back and talk a little bit about the Canadian aspect because each of you have kind of highlighted the Canadian aspect and some interesting, so we'll talk about that in a second. Don, I wanted to speak with you. When you were speaking about or talking about your commercialization strategy, you spoke about kind of opposite, almost the opposite of Joanna, having the benefits of Big Brother, a big channel partner to drive your business uh, to market. Could you tell the group a little bit about the context and your strategic decision to engage a big, a big partner? Well, in the end, it depends on the product you're introducing into Absolutely. the marketplace. So, you know, when I think about like a medical technology product, um, they don't stand on their own. They need to be integrated into a supply chain and a care chain. And, um, and so, you know, working on a product right now that has to do with medication management uh, adherence and compliance monitoring. Um, for it really to work, it needs to fit into the supply chain, and the supply chain has existing technology in it, such as packaging technology, and how do you get it packaged, uh, but it's also the pharmacy management systems that are in place, um, and you know, how do you exchange all that information, but if you decide that you're going to integrate into that system, then um, basically, you're making yourself a partner in the existing system. You're not trying to change the system or expect a new one to develop uh, independently. You know, certainly with um, you know, the PharmaTrust ATMs, we needed to integrate with the pharmacy management system. We needed to integrate with their supply chain. And so um, in order to look attractive to them, um, it had to fit. And when you fit, it makes it much easier to buy because now you've checked off all those things that they need addressed. So if you start that you know, at, you know, off at the beginning and, that, and make that part of your product plan, then you know, there's a catcher's mitt sitting there. And you're actually having those discussions early and you're building a relationship and not trying to sell them. But you got the relationship so that when you're, you're ready, they're sitting there. I mean, so many of the technology companies I work with, great technology, so how are you going to commercialize it? What? Yeah. I don't know. You know and they don't, they don't see this big picture that you're articulating, how to connect it to become part of the ecosystem. They only see it as a technology to, onto itself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you see it day to day. I mean, um, lots of people are making great money out of Facebook. Right. It's all these secondary, the whole secondary industry is developed around it. Um, and so, what's your channel to market? Well, you build an app and it goes into that store. Um, you always want to be there first, though, right? Before the signal, to, you know, the signal gets drowned out by the noise. Um, but yeah, if you're in that tech space, you're going to have to integrate, make it easy for the customer to buy and adopt. 
So kind of continuing on on this theme of commercialization, I just wanted to speak a little bit about organizing teams and how you organize your company to, set, to be set up for success. Really a lot of the traditional model of organizing companies has been building large teams and hiring a CFO and a chief marketing officer and having a lot of full-time people. I know you guys have really chosen almost the opposite approach, building smaller virtual teams or just hiring a handful of people to drive your business. If you could share with me, and this is an open question, whoever's most passionate on this topic, but I'll definitely get two or three of you to comment. Could you tell me a little bit about how you've structured your organization and why you made the decisions you did and how you anticipate that in the future will, will change? Joanna, you wanna kick it off? Sure. Um, so the first thing that I did when looking at hiring people was to think, recognize what I know and recognize what I don't know. So I have a business background and I worked in marketing and PR for a very long time, but I didn't know the first thing about production or the first thing about bringing a product to market. So instead of hiring my best friend from business school, as an example, I hired um, someone that I worked with 12 years ago as a summer intern who had a lot of experience in the apparel industry, who knew everything. And um, she started as my mentor. And then as we started growing, we made the decision to bring her on um, and to, to work for the company. Um, I, I've taken the approach of hiring slowly because um, the, I think it's really important to keep your overhead and your burn rate very low when you're a startup. And you know, there's this appeal to go out and raise a million dollars and to hire 50 people and to make a big splash and to have that be your success. Your success should never be how much money you've raised. It should be your accomplishments with your, with your product and with what you're doing your company and what you're doing. So there's you, and then you have the, your one other... Yeah, I have a full-time employee who handles our marketing and social media who's in the office. Right. And then I have a couple people who are on contract. Um, and then I make use of, of agencies, which is what we were talking about earlier. Okay. So picking the best experts that know what we're doing and, um, and working with them on an agency level. So you kind of pick two or three areas where full-time hire, yes, yeah. very specific, yeah. critical to your business made sense, yeah. and the rest is all a virtual organization. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Good. Don or cha cha you? But similar to Joanna, we outsource basically everything. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, we uh, essentially uh, are run <laughs> uh, because of um, my partner and, and my um, pharmaceutical backgrounds. We are run like a pharmaceutical company, and in our careers, we've managed hundreds of people, you know, over different organizations. And so we actually made the decision at this point in our careers to stay entirely virtual and instead manage uh, and outsource very high-level uh, experienced teams. So, uh, you know, the PR agency uh, that we utilize is the PR agency for Burt's Bees. And that's because everyone thinks we're like Burt's Bees. And so it only made sense to hire a firm that uh, you know, can do uh, you know, what they've done for Burt's Bees in Canada, which is you know, they've been with Burt's Bees right from the beginning and they have uh, you know, uh, quadrupled actually five times um, the revenue of Burt's Bees in their in their time with um, with them here in Canada. Uh, we have a senior level salesperson who um, does all our sales. He has he outsources work as well to a six person team. So uh, he does all the account management. He does all the door knocking. He calls me when there's a logistical issue. Uh, with our distributor, McKesson, uh, and uh, our manufacturer, uh, also very high level. They have lots of clients in the States. Uh, we deal on a day-to-day -day ba basis with the business owners. And so we're business owners dealing with business owners. And so that's really our model because um, we found it very effective in terms of uh, getting the work done. Now, there, that means that there are, uh, there are always timing issues and delay issues when you have a highly experienced team that's only dedicating part of their time. So one of the downfalls is sequencing and 
Absolutely. How do you engage your partners to ensure that they're continually motivated along right. your timelines? Just one, one side question. You mentioned working in multinationals, leading businesses, and now you're an entrepreneur. How have you found the transition from working in big companies to being an entrepreneur? Uh, it's, it's an entirely different culture. <laughs> it's really, I mean, it's really uh, a huge learning curve. Um, you know, I went from a media ban at home. So my kids, we don't have a TV. My kids don't watch TV. You know, they have limited time on the internet. We don't have any magazine subscriptions except to The Economist and Owl magazine. And, um, you know, so uh, I went from basically not knowing what, you know, what uh, Slice or W or all these TV channels are to having to learn about media and magazines. So, you know, I'd, I'd go into uh, bookstores and just flip through all these different magazines, trying to understand what's their demographic, you know, what are we actually trying to do with this product? So. For me, that was the, the biggest learning curve. Um, culturally, it's amazing. I mean, you know, it's great to wake up every day, you know, uh, to emails from women who tell me how much the product has helped them. Um, it's, you know, it's a headache sometimes to, you know, deal with um, logistics at a very sort of basic level, like when I'm, you know, packaging things to ship. You know, I always had a staff to do that. Right. <laughs> so, you know, there's definitely a lot of that. But, you know, it's, it, it is stressful because, uh, you know, the dollar that you earn is now the dollar that you earn That's as right. opposed to the dollar that you're earning for your company. That's right. Good. Don, yeah. did you have something you wanted to weigh in on this one? Or? I agree with the outsourcing a lot. Um, what's interesting in your case is that you've got the IP. Um, and you're the designer as well, right? So the IP is, I'm an accountant <laughs> originally, okay, not anymore. Um, but um, when I want to do a project, um, I need to hire people to get the stuff done. Um, so I'm the visionary guy, business guy, um, put the business model together, all of that. But. Um, so you really need to focus on you know, what is critical to the business. And so the IP is critical to the business. And, um, and so in the case of, say, implied recognition, we have, I would say, three people um, who are fundamental to the company. And, um, but I can outsource everything else. And uh, outsourcing is really quite good when you think about what it takes to hire an employee. Number one, there is step cost, right? You need this much, but you still have to pay an extra 30% because they're, you know, they're fulfilling the 70% requirement, which was the breaking point before you actually hired a person. But even when you hire them, they take a while to come on board. It could be three months before they become effective. And then what if they don't fit? Mm -hmm. And. Um, and then you have to get, it's not just one person, it's three people, or it could be a team. So outsourcing the non-critical IP means that you can, it's like a one-time deal. You know how much time it's gonna take, you know how much it's gonna cost you. Um, from a cash flow perspective, you know, at the end of the contract, well, you don't have to pay anymore. Whereas if an employee's there, you have to keep, keep on making those payments. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of value because when you outsource, especially with the small Canadian entrepreneurial companies, um, they can get things done very quickly. Mm -hmm. And they put together the expertise to fulfill that role, be it marketing or be it product development. There's a, a lot of good design shops uh, in Toronto, I think there's at least a dozen, that are quite capable of actually creating a medical device. They don't know what a medical, that de medical device should look like, um, that's where, you know, that's what you keep inside the company. And you can also split it up between groups. You know, how much do you want to put overseas? Not very much. But the easy stuff, yeah, you can do that. But uh, it's, it becomes, you can buy it and you get it faster and, you, and once it's done, it's over. So big, big uh, impact on cash Sounds flow. like all of you have the same model. Essentially, 
hire one or two or three people that are critical to the business and outsource everything that's more com a commoditized skill set. Mm -hmm. Until you get bigger. Yeah. Right? And then as you get bigger, you can afford to do more, and then you want to you know, expand your business. Yeah. Great. Well, I have one more question for the panel, and then I'm going to open up the individual mics because we don't want to be dominating the topics up here. So please, if you have a question, get ready. We've got a mic on the left and a mic on the right, my left and my right. So just one question to sort of close in formally, and then we'll, we'll open it up to the group. Could you share with the group the one or two key ahas you've had as an entrepreneur, the one or two key lessons you'd like to share with aspiring entrepreneurs in this, in this audience about what you've learned over the last number of years, Don, the last number of companies you've opened, et cetera? Look before you leap. Um, do your market research. Do your research. You know, like you were surprised about the need in the marketplace. Once you quantified that, you go, oh my god, there's a huge opportunity here. Mm -hmm. And that is what allows you to take on risk. So you have to actually think it out ahead of time. And and the beauty of the net is that it's all sitting there. You can do market research 100%. Um, and you also need to know your competition for two reasons. One is you need to know your competition. The other one is you can learn from them. Yeah. And so that, um, you know, because eventually you're going to have to compete against them. So, you know, do your homework. It's worth the effort. Um, before I started Pharma Trust, I wrote, it took me a year to write the business plan. Um, it tends to take me a year to write a business plan. But I've done my homework, and I've basically taken that huge risk and actually quantified it and given me focus, and so that now I have the guts to take it on. I, get, I, get, I think this is a great lesson, especially about spending time up front to do the re research and the business plan. Uh, I have several clients of mine come to me and they say, here's my business plan, and it's essentially a half a page document. Yeah. And I'm like, you haven't thought through the 18 issues. Who's your customer? Who are your competitors? What's the company value proposition? How are you going to go to market? So great lessons. Joanna. Yeah, I totally agree. I spent about a year and a half just researching before I made the decision to move forward with this, this concept. Um, what have I learned? Everything takes a lot longer than you think it's going to, and you need so much more money than you think you're going to need. That's definitely one thing. Um, the other thing I would say that I've learned a lot, you know, um, is that the idea is the easy part. Like having a great idea is the easy part. It's the execution that is the challenge. Absolutely. And that is something that um, the day, and you know, we were talking about this earlier, the day that you have customers, um, whether they're consumers or, or bigger um, or multinational organizations, the day that you have product moving and logistics or that you have your, your app is live and it's being like, as you know, with your money companies, so I shouldn't be telling you this, but everything changes. And so um, that's been a really big learning. And you make sure that you're obsessed with your idea because, um, you know, it's a, lo it's a lot of work. I got married on December 31st and um, since I've been home from my honeymoon, I think I spent three nights with my husband. Like, just get ready to work your butt off, and you have to love your idea if you're going to work your butt off like that. And is your husband a, a, a user of the underwear now? <laughs> <laughs> he works in, uh, in, in advertising on the creative side, so he's been really instrumental. He came up with our names and all our taglines and a lot of our branding pieces. And um, he doesn't wear the underwear, though, okay. but um, he's a fan of the underwear. OK. Yeah. Good. No lines. What's not to be a fan exactly, of? Exactly, exactly. Any final comments about lessons you've learned? I think um, just um, believe that you can do it. Uh, you know, try and do things that are, are new. I made a switch from the pharmaceutical industry basically to a consumer goods industry. Uh, and um, the last thing I thought I would be doing would be going uh, on national TV to talk about vaginal dryness. Um, and uh, really, even when I was filming it, I couldn't believe I was doing it. And um, it turned out to be a wonderful uh, jump start. Uh, I think um, 
they're actually auditioning right now. So if anyone has, uh, you know, I seriously recommend it because. Uh, I'm going to do it. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience and, um, and, you know, just believe that you can do these things. Uh, maybe I was a little naive, <laughs> but I believe that I could. And, um, and I think my biggest learning has really been around the marketing. Everyone kept saying, okay, you need to get a ton of marketing dollars to get into the chains. And that's, that was very untrue in our, from our perspective. We did zero marketing and we got into the chains who have been highly supportive and uh, they uh, do their own in-store marketing, uh, which helps too. Now, the challenge then is how do you direct women into these stores if they don't know about your uh, brand? And so, you know, there's definitely um, a lot of marketing that needs to be done on a day-to-day -day basis. And so don't underestimate the need for that, but also don't overestimate the need for that. So it's, it's really, that, it's really sort of a, a, a really, a, for me as a scientist, trained as a scientist, it is such an art to know where to put your marketing dollars. And these days, um, when you know Gangnam Style, you know has whatever three billion hits on YouTube, you know everyone is saying go go YouTube. You know I have no idea if I should go YouTube or not. You know, and so I grapple with these decisions, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis on where do we put our marketing dollars? Should we do something on YouTube or not? Everyone's saying yeah, do YouTube, but you know at some level. You know, I think it might, you know, my dollars might be better spent, uh, you know, um, you know, on flyers at a women's show or something like that. So, you know, these are, these, they seem sort of, um, when you, when you're building the concept and the vision, you know, these, these, these uh, decisions seem unimportant, but they end up being very important on a day-to-day -day basis. Good. And we'll talk about, I can talk to you a little bit about that after some experiences <laughs> in this trade-off. Sir. Thank you, panel, for a great discussion. When it comes to something dealing with women's health care, and especially uh, the most intimate when it comes to health care, the concern I've got is what you as a company have to go through before you even get it to the shelf, especially in light of the fact that uh, with your product, the alternatives if a woman is to go to uh, a gynecologist or what have you and say what's out there, they're told, well, there's this and this and this, but if you start using this, there is a chance that not only is it not going to work, but there are going to be serious side effects, including uh, the big C, uh, in terms of cervical cancer or other things. What did you have to go through with Health Canada, and possibly down the line, the FDA, before you can even get it to the shelf. So are you asking a little bit about the regulatory Sounds process, more I, or less? Because a lot, of, well, a lot of what you have to go through before you can even get to the shelf is to say, as part of the niche, oh, by the way, not only are you all natural, but you don't have all the, th all the side effects so that... So I guess maybe restate it, and we'll, I'll direct this to Cha Cha, which is you're really asking about the regulatory process and the burden of safety and efficacy from a, a Health Canada perspective. Definitely, uh, this um, product, from a formulation perspective, went through many formulations, and um, you know we first of all it's made with pharmaceutical grade in ingredients and I can tell you it is not easy finding pharmaceutical grade natural products mm. you think oh I can buy you know this product cocoa butter anywhere well it, it turns out you actually can't if you want uh, consistency and batch to batch consistency and stability over a long term so there is you know there uh, was decades of you know, scientific chemi chemical and um, clinical trial and regulatory expertise that went into the formulation. We worked with an academic group uh, in, uh, out on the West Coast. 
Uh, we did our own uh, internal regulatory work. We had uh, regulatory expertise in consulting, and uh, it's you know it's all uh, a process. And as part of the process, you do need a lot of scientific and other expertise. And then what happens is you get the product into McKesson, which is uh, Canada's largest uh, pharmaceutical distributor. Their sales are about 10 billion a year in Canada. In the States, their sales are 120 billion a year. And then they tell you, bef even, so we ship product and products in their warehouse, and they're not, they're not sending product out. And we have stores asking, and we're like, you know, we call up McKesson, and we go, hey, what's, what's wrong? You know, you have the product in your inventory. And then they say to you, well, uh, we've decided to do an impromptu regulatory review, right, of their own. And so, you know, definitely there are lots of logistics um, with health products that you'll go through. And it'll be very similar with the FDA. Mm -hmm. um, what we have to do, though, is we have to be mindful and careful of uh, potential issues. So there's a very prominent natural health company here in Canada that um, create, that uh, built up, uh, had a, a failed U.S. launch. They built up several million dollars in inventory, shipped it across the border, and uh, the FDA uh, compounded, you know, it, you know they, they said, well, in Canada, you're making claims on this product because you went through this regulatory process, but in the States, you are not making claims and you can't sell the product. So there are lots of things that we have to do. For example, we are going to ship product in the U.S. as a test ship. We will have issues likely when we cross the border, even though we have experienced customer brokers, we have a harmonization code from Export Canada, we have all the paperwork done, but we will still do it. And so what we do um, as a company is we try and test the market. Wait a minute. Yeah, little bit by little. And so in this particular case, for in, in the last thing I want to be doing is building $3 million in inventory that gets stopped at the border by the FDA. That's right. And CVS is knocking on my door saying, you know, you didn't deliver and we're going to penalize you. Mm -hmm. okay. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes. Good. Thank you. I'll take your question next and then I see you, sir. You'll go right after. Um, hello, Please. my name is Anna, and I am a co-founder of Sprightly. Uh, hello? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, my name is Anna, and I'm co-founder of Sprightly. Uh, my question goes to both ladies. Uh, we are in a customer development stage, and I'm curious, um, what advice do you have if the problem that you're solving is a problem that people maybe do not want to talk about? So what would be your advice? Maybe I'll start with Joanna on this one, please. Yeah, so I have a lot of experience in that regard. When I launched the product, we did it with a crowdfunding campaign, and I talked only about stress incontinence. And um, it wasn't working. Learned very quickly that people don't like to be told that they have a problem. They don't know what the problem is. They don't know what it's called. We were making people uncomfortable. So what we've decided to do, and I don't know if it's relevant for you, but we've gone We've actually gone really broad in our marketing, and we've, um, through directly engaging with the end consumer and with our retail partners, we found words that um, resonate with women. So fresh being a word, you know, if we're saying we'll keep you fresh and we have you covered no matter what, women kind of go make their own decisions. You know, it could be because they go to a hot yoga class and they're sweating, or it could be because they can't jump on a trampoline or laugh without leaking, right? So we've decided to kind of go broader and to talk about things in a way that's approachable um, so that we could be in places like Hudson's Bay without making the sales staff uncomfortable because they don't want to ask women if they, the, if a woman sneezes in front of them and they don't want to be like, oh, did you just leak? So um, talk to your end customer, talk to experts in that industry. I'm sure you did this. You know, I, I met with a lot of gynecologists, urinary gynecologists, um, talk to them about what about how they approach things in the way that they talk about it, and then test and um, pivot. That's the best thing that I can say. It's just like, if it's not working, make a decision quickly and, and pivot. Yeah, I don't know if you... Did you have something else, Jen? Uh, we, maybe due to my naivete and lack of marketing experience, um, we 
actually just tackled it head on. So um, for me, the disconnect was um, as I was doing my research, you know, reading, and now, for example, a gynecologist emailed me last week from uh, the largest women's health hospital in uh, Alberta, and you know, she emailed saying she wanted samples because 95% of her patients have vaginal atrophy. And so the numbers are really vary. When I started re doing my research, I read one uh, British study, 20 years old, old, that said only 7% of women, menopausal women, had vaginal dryness. Right. And so over the course of decades, it's now, you know, I heard from this gynecologist, 95% of her patients. So it's probably most women, <laughs> you know. And so for me, the disconnect was why were there no really, for me, um, safe and healthy products when most women have this issue? And when I started talking to women about it, women were very open about talking about this issue. So in our marketing, we actually decided to take it really head on. So, um, you know, our, um, our product says, um, first of all, it's named after May West, so it's called May. Uh, and it says, hi, I'm May, and I naturally restore vaginal moisture. Feeling drier than a British comedy. Honey, you're not alone. Pick me up, take me home, and get ready to feel like a teenager again, but with better judgment. <laughs> and, you know, and it really could just be because I have no experience in marketing and I just... No, oh, that's great marketing. You, well, you, you just know, describe, that's great. We just yeah. wanted to put it out there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, um, and so, uh, incredibly, this resonates, I think, with women. I think it resonates with the retail chains. I've only had pushback from uh, one pharmacist in one retail chain, and even then it didn't matter, the category manager and the buyer, you know, um, uh, ha, you know has placed it in all his stores. So um, in this particular, um, for this particular product, we just decided to tackle it head on. Can I give one more piece of advice quickly? John was talking about look, at, look to your competitors and see what they do. Look to similar people in your space and see how they're approaching it and see what's working and what's not working. Read the blogs, read the comments on their websites. Like they've already spent a lot of money trying to figure it out. And you can actually learn a lot about your approach by seeing what they've done and the mistakes that they've made and avoiding them. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Sir. Hello. I don't think my, oh it is. Uh, hi, my name is Ray. I'm a third year student from the University of Toronto. I'm currently working on a crowdfunding startup. Uh, recently, earlier this month, I organized a Young Entrepreneurs Conference at U of T, and one of the speakers we had had an interesting point that he wanted to emphasize to us, which was to focus on getting startup customers rather than startup capital. And I feel like a lot of what you guys have done was sought that instead of you know venture capitalists or investors. So I want to get your opinion on you know, that topic. Don, did you want to make, kick this one off? Did you have startup customers as, as opposed to startup capital? Yeah, there's nothing better than a, well, customer or partner, yeah. channel partner. Um, you were talking about how some of your suppliers were actually making investments in you. Um, a lot of these firms will actually, they do have venture arms, that type of thing that they will make an investment in you. And um, yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah, I experienced it. And uh, that means they're, they want to see you successful. And they're going to help you. So yeah, if you can build, you know, if, build a relationship, and um, you're going to be surprised what comes out of that relationship. I mean, I would just build on, unless you guys have additional comments to make. But, I mean, in a couple of companies I work with, having that startup customer is tremendously important because it validates the idea yeah. and it also exponentially increases the valuation of your company. Because now potential investors are seeing, oh, you can make sales and you have achieved sales. I'm sure Cha Cha on Dragger's Den, we always see, they always ask the same question. So how much business have you done? Yeah. And if you say, oh, I've done fifty, a hundred thousand dollars, the valuation is exponentially higher. Anything else that you guys wanted to add? Well, I, that's sort of crossing the chasm type uh, philosophy as well, right? 
you find the early, early adopter. Um, you know, go on to TED and look up Seth Godin, and he's even talking about in the consumer space. You know, it's no longer ma you know marketing to the masses; it's actually marketing to those early adopters, the obsessives. And once they adopt, they're going to tell other people, and then that word of mouth starts moving. And I can't remember. I think it was maybe it was you, Cha Cha, who said when you looked at your customer base, you had one customer that spent like. Twenty thousand yeah, dollars. She's she is obsessed. Yes, <laughs> and um, she if uh, well, I finally actually um, so finally now that we have uh, national distribution, um, uh, you know, I've directed her to a store that um, is stocking it for her. And uh, but whenever she was a day late in her shipments, we would get an email and um, or a call. And so definitely those early adopters and startup um, customers, but um, I, I also think the startup, as you said, the startup um, partners, basically, you know, for me were very key because it took a long time to develop and formulate and package and actually have something, you know, ready to um, give to a customer. And, um, and they were uh, integral and crucial. Um, we, uh, we have turned down two rounds of financing because our valuation in increases and um, you know and so uh, financing comes you know as, as you've also mentioned John it comes with its own issues um, you know we have a very savvy US sales group and uh, you know they've said to us we've watched so many companies take financing and then all of a sudden they've got you know the millions of dollars to spend on marketing and then they just spend it wrong. Mm -hmm. You get careless. Yeah, you get careless because you think you have the money in the bank. The other benefit of that first customer, and I'm sure you probably talked about this at your panel, is that first customer ends up speaking to 100 people because they're brand advocates. Yeah. Customer number 1,000 might only speak to five people. So that first 100, 200, 300 customers really grow your valuation, exponentially grow your word of mouth, et cetera. So absolutely critical, really good point. Does that, does that answer your question? Um, it does. I also wanted to ask, um, would you say that it affects the amount of liability that you take on? Because if you don't have a, you know, an initial investor, you're not taking on a million dollars at once and you know, taking on that liability as well. Whereas now you have 20,000 customers who are investing a lot smaller amounts. So would you say that the liability is a lot less, or is it more complicated now because it's spread out across the market? I mean, are you asking the difference between, or, or exploring the difference between a crowdsourcing with a thousand investors versus yeah. a single? I guess I am. Yeah. And so, what's the different risk profile difference of one investor versus a thousand yes. investors? What from kind of from your experience, are you, anyway. are you doing equity crowdfunding? Yes. You are okay. Investors are, I mean, I, you probably know more about this than I do, but the m investors can end up taking up a lot of your time. You have to be really clear up front on the expectations in terms of reporting and contact and all those things. And if you, if you don't set parameters in the beginning, they can end up, if you have too many of them, it can become a distraction. And when you launch a business, the most precious thing that you have is your time. Like, all I want to do is clone myself and put a version of me in the US so I don't have to travel there all the time. And so like if you're on the phone with a bunch of investors all the time, then you're not getting customers. You're explaining things and you're so I think you just have to be clear and set expectations in terms of what you're going to offer them. You know, like maybe you're going to go onto Gust or one of those platforms and you'll share a monthly update that they can get access to and that's how they that's how they hear what's happening, right? Like as long as you streamline it. Um, and they're not expecting that you'll talk to every single one of them a month because all of a sudden your whole month is gone if you have a hundred investors. Yeah, now I, I suppose the difference is in a crowdsourcing model, you have a whole bunch of small investors where the the reporting burden might be kind of must might be lower. So maybe it's not as hopefully yes yeah having yeah. multiple investors. But I don't know if there's a risk. I haven't really had a lot of experience to art, be able to articulate if there's a difference from a risk profile perspective having one versus. A thousand. I don't know if uh, you can have, you know, crowdsourcing is one, and you know, there's no one-on-one uh, -on -one contact. 
So you can use the net and gust and, and similar. But reporting to your investors, I believe, is very important. Is important. Um, you yeah. don't take yeah. their money and, and, and just go on. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a responsibility when you take other people's money. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You may not succeed, but uh, you still have to respect that. Resp you know, their, their support of you. Uh, when it comes to angel investors, uh, some angels, it's sort of a hobby for them. And they have extra time, and they're going to keep sending emails, and, uh, and so that you, uh, you have to be able to control that. Um, when you get into sort of the, the more sophisticated investors, the BC, um, no, you're going to have to do regular reporting, um, cash flow forecasting, uh, performance measurement, all those different things. So, you know, if you don't need an investor, that's, even, that's the best situation possible. Is it good? Yeah, thanks so much. We only have another few minutes left. Are there other questions? Yeah, Sir. Um, I'd just be interested in getting uh, some comments from each of you. Um, your strategic outlook on your businesses. Where do you want to take your business, or where would you like to see your business and get to a milestone, whether it's to exit or to conquer the world, or whatever it may be? I'd be interested to hear what each of you Vision. aspires. Yeah. So maybe I'll go in reverse order. Don, you want to keep? <laughs> What's your vision? Oh man, that's a tough one. Because um, you've exited a couple of times. Yeah, it, 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 it all depends on what really inspires you. Um, yeah, I guess I'm a serial entrepreneur, and I have a couple of more ideas just sitting there and waiting, and I'm sort of being held back by this one. And so, um, but the reality is, is that you know you can bring it to a certain stage. Um, but can you build a whole company around it? Um, you know, can you become a, you know, you know, Facebook is just an anomaly. Just forget about that. Uh, but, you know, can you build a $100 million company out of it? Can you be a Lululemon? Um, and so it, it depends on where you want to take it. There is a stage that you have to realize that you're, you, you know, if you put it on that growth curve and you've taken an idea and brought it to reality, You've, you've taken it up there. And so it's got this value in your mind right there, but you can sell it for the value up here because you can give it to someone else who has the infrastructure, has the channel and distribution, all those other things that you're going to actually have to raise money and put into. And it's really not you know, executing on your vision or your product. So you know, there is a point in which you can exit and achieve your returns. So it all depends, you know, it's, um, you know, but, to be... But for you as a serial entrepreneur, I would imagine that your pattern has been, so therefore I'm going to predict that that historical pattern represents the future, that you will take it yeah, to a certain point. I think point, I'm going to go that route, yeah. Exit, and then start on the next idea. Because you're already getting anxious already. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> you see, I mean, my biggest problem is I see all sorts of opportunity. Right. And I can articulate those into business opportunities as well and, yeah. ex and execute. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Joanna. I guess when I think about Nixor and what we're trying to do, I'm, I look to the company Spanx that really took off in the shaper category and you know, shook up an industry and made a really innovative new product that kind of disrupted everything else around it. So that's what we're trying to do, is to, is to be the brand name in the high-tech underwear industry for women and to um, continue to develop products that are, have great functionality and that offer something else above what they can currently get, which I think is probably in your wheelhouse as well. Um, in terms of how long am I going to do this for, I have no idea. Um, mentally, I've kind of prepared myself to continue at this pace for, for five years then I might keel over and, and drop dead. So, <laughs> um, but uh, yes, I don't, so um, an exit, I guess, is, is in my mind at some point. But first, I want to build a fantastic brand and company that women love. The vision that I have for my company, D Demiva, is that essentially at some point, um, we will no longer need a Demiva. In other words, these socially taboo and awkward uh, you know, health topics for women will no longer be taboo. Uh, and um, I don't know how long that will take. Um, I hope it'll be sooner than later. 
Um, we have, uh, we're very much built around natural health and I do believe that that revolution is already here. Uh, just like everyone is gluten-free, um, we were gluten-free as a family 13 years ago. It was really hard to find gluten-free products. Walmart just um, put a ban on um, parabens and phthalates and other toxic chemicals in all their personal care products to be eliminated by 2016. So uh, that's very interesting, very much an innovative leader in the personal health care space. Um, and so we, it's not so apparent right now uh, to most people, but the shampoos and soaps and everything we use are really toxic. Um, you know, the level of um, uh, parabens and phthalates in people's uh, circulatory systems are super high. It's incredible if you read studies. And that hasn't yet um, sort of, I think, become a revolution because these personal care companies are dominated by big corporations that make a lot of money on your shampoo and your KY jelly and other products. But the consumers are uh, much more savvy, and so I think that we're on the we're already in that space now. As for the space of women's health in terms of these, um, uh, you know, taboo topics, I think we're starting to get there. Everyone seems to think that Demiva is a little bit early as a brand. However, there are um, a lot of customers and retail chains that are just buying. So at some level, we must not be too early. But um, uh, as Joanna said, I don't think I could do this for 20 years, <laughs> 14 hours a day. Um, and, uh, but my vision is to you know, grow the company long enough to hopefully see that, uh, that these issues are no longer issues. And I'll just make one final point. First of all, the takeaway is don't go, don't shower tonight, right? Of course, and so make sure you write that one down. Uh, I would just say that from a, a human resource perspective, whenever I've worked with entrepreneurs, I see them grow to a certain point. Then at a certain point, really there becomes a skill disconnect yeah. between their ability to truly operationalize a company and make it a hundred million dollar company versus the skill set to start up so a, a company. And, and I know there's some HR per people in the audience who can comment on this further during the, the, the breakouts. But I mean, I very rarely see a CEO of a startup, and I think Facebook and others are the exception, that you can take it all the way. You tend to hand it off. Well, <laughs> what they do is they build management around oh, these. Oh, absolutely. You know, like, you know, the, Bergen, you know, Sergey, you know, they built yeah. a whole company around yeah. them, um, which has happened a lot with... Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, you know, but, um, yeah, sorry. No, no, I, I, I agree with you, but yeah. single-handedly, they're not, they're not doing that. They have to, they have to change the skill sets right. of their company. But do realize that there are more professional managers out there. There are a dime a dozen. Whereas how many entrepreneurs that can actually take an idea and launch it and put it into the marketplace. Now you're down to one, you know, half a percent of the Canadian population. So, you know, would not want to diminish the, uh, that person and, you know, to say that, you know, they peak out at a certain spot. Um, you know, starting something from scratch is the hardest thing to do. Sorry, I didn't... <laughs> oh, no, good, Don, I love it. <laughs> Any other questions before we finish up here this evening? give a plug. Sure. I just launched a crowdfunding campaign and I wouldn't be an entrepreneur in front of a room of people if I didn't pitch you on it. So <laughs> forgive me if it's tacky, but um, I'd love for you to check it out. So Lycra approached us in the fall to co-create the ultimate athletic underwear for women. 93% um, of women aren't happy with their underwear when they exercise and it's something that's been um, overlooked in the market, uh, which is dominated by some really big athletic brands where women's underwear is kind of an afterthought and for us it's our only thought. So if you have a chance and you could check it out, that would be great. It's um, on Indiegogo right now, and it's called Fitnix by Nixwear. Thank you, and nice. tell your friends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just had a quick question. In, short you know, one, so we only have four company. minutes left. It was, um, you, we've been talking about lower garments. Are yeah. you looking to line extension to upper garment in women as well? Yes, definitely. <laughs> it's just. Um, so if we hit a certain milestone in this crowdfunding campaign, we're going to announce that we'll make a sports bra. 
um, but we're far off from that milestone at the moment. So we'll introduce new products. I have plans on putting our patented technology into <coughs> yoga pants and running shorts and you kind of name it. It just, everything has to be so well thought out and executed. And I wouldn't want to rush a new product to the market if it wasn't much better than what's already there. So yes, so definitely. Good, well, any questions online? Are we okay? Uh, we're good, no questions here. So we can good. end here. Good. Well, thank you very much for the time. Thank you to the panelists for taking the time to both prepare and be on today's panel. Thank you.